Hi, I'm Ariel. You're watching She Wants Addiction, and today I'm going to be doing a library haul. I know I don't typically do a lot of haul videos on my channel, and I've explained before, like, why I don't like them, which is primarily because I feel like they're not inclusive of everybody, and also because I don't like the consumerist aspect of the book community. But I'm choosing to do one today because, and I feel like there's a couple different reasons. The first being, there's just been a lot going on in my life, like, as far as personally right now, like, I just got done doing eight days in a row of work, and so that was a lot. And then also, I'm kind of sick, which, so if my voice sounds weird right now, like, that's the reason why. And then also, I've kind of been wanting to do a library haul anyway, just to sort of normalize, I guess, getting books from the library or, like, using the library, because I feel like primarily on, like, book, booktube and bookstagram, a lot of what I see are books that people have purchased and so I just want to kind of normalize that alternative and normalize getting your books from the library. Like I feel like a lot of people when they photograph books they want to use brand new books um, because they don't have the library stickers and they find it like kind of ugly or unsightly. But I don't think that everything has to be about appearances in life and so I kind of want to set that example not to hate on the people that have the the extra spending money to be able to purchase books etc but i want to to normalize using the library and also i want to kind of get back into the swing of filming because if you follow me on instagram you probably saw there was a, a racist incident in my work which is not the first incident and certainly not the first incident in my life but i think it really affected me and so i had all of these these much more deep discussion videos planned. I read a lot of anti-racist books recently and I was planning on doing a video, breaking all of those down, comparing and contrasting and talking about it, but I just feel like right now I'm not interested in doing something so heavy, so I'm gonna kind of give myself this lighthearted video to film until I get to feeling better so that I can actually make those videos that I had planned to do before, if that makes sense. So let's go ahead and hop right in and just see what I've got here. The first book I'm going to talk about is I Am Nobody's Inward. This is by Dean Atta. And a lot of these books that I'm going to talk about are ones that I specifically requested my library to buy. I am able, as a patron, to request that they purchase three books per month. And so this is one of the books that I suggested for them to purchase. And you guys might know if you've already read The Black Flamingo or you've seen it around. That book is very, very popular right now. It's kind of a, a YA coming of age of a gay mixed boy I believe. I obviously haven't read it yet, I'm still on the waiting list, but I looked up the author and this is his other book that was available. It's a poetry book and so the library did actually agree to purchase this for me and I believe I asked for it like two months ago and, and it finally came in. This book was only like a hundred pages long and I already read it last night and this morning and to be honest with you all I was not impressed with this at all. Evaluating it on purely a technical level, I really felt like the poetry in here was very simplistic rhyming and it was not, the language was not very poetic at all, what I would think of as poetic. It really just felt like someone sort of writing down their thoughts and, you know, using line breaks. And then as far as like the content of these poems, I really did not like it. I thought based off of the title, this was, uh, you know, going to be a poem or a book of poems that was sort of uh, confronting racism or dealing with white people in a very honest and direct way, kind of like Even This Page is White by Vivek Shreya, but that did not end up being the case at all. The title poem in here is actually, he tells off a bunch of hip hop artists for using the N word in their songs because that is the last word that a lot of people that were lynched and had violent acts committed against them heard. And I'm not at all disputing that black people can have different perspectives on the usage and reclamation of the n-word but personally i just felt like it was so just stupid to berate hip-hop artists who are using it um, in the reclaimed way however you feel about, personally about the n-word you can choose whether to use it or not i don't see the need to go around telling people what they should and shouldn't use like i feel like if black people want to reclaim that word they have the right if black people don't want to use that word they have the right personally i probably fall somewhere in the middle i have no problem with it when it's used um, not with the hard R and not by white people, but like the reclaimed version, I personally don't say it a whole lot and I don't use it a whole lot. It's not something that I find to be part of my vocabulary, but also I don't have a problem with people using that and lyricists using it in their songs as long as they're not white. The black experience is not one singular experience, right? Like black people are not a monolith. I say that all the time. And so 
I am not disputing his ability to dislike the N-word, to say whatever he wants, but when you start lecturing other people on what they should and shouldn't use and what they can and cannot do, it really feels a bit boomerish to me. Like a lot of these poems felt very boomerish and I don't know how else to describe it. Like the, the, the more that I read, the more I disliked the poetry. I was just kind of skimming it, but then I saw like references to being a gay Christian and I was just kind of like rolling my eyes. And then there was a reference that really disturbed me to kind of an age gap relationship where he talks about um, the person he was in a relationship with being a teenager and him being an adult. So I don't know what the deets were there, but that was kind of a yikes for me. I was like, is he disclosing an underage relationship here or is it just an age gap? Like either way, I don't know. I kind of don't want to know, <laughs> you know? I just felt like these poems were really preachy and kind of obvious in their morals. If you read the poem called Key to the City, I really felt like this is evident. Probably the best poem in here I would say is Mother Tongue, where he kind of talks about not understanding why his mother didn't teach um, him and his siblings her native language so that they could communicate with their extended family. And it's not that he didn't bring up a lot of important and relevant issues in here, I just felt like the language wasn't poetic. And then also, um, just a lot of his views I strongly disagree with. He, I feel like he falls squarely into like the black conservative camp. Also possibly subscribes to the politics of respectability. So yeah, I, I really could not get behind this. I was very disappointed by this. I'm hoping that the Black Flamingo will be better because I've seen nothing but rave reviews for that book. And hopefully that's the case and I, and I end up loving it because this was like borderline one star for me. Okay, the next book I have to talk about is Out of the Woods. This is by Luke Turner. And I saw this on Charlotte at Tired Mama Tries to Read. I will link her channel below. But essentially this is a narrative about a bisexual man, I believe. And because I see so little bisexual representation even within queer books. And honestly, I, I don't think I've ever read a book with a bisexual narrator who like I connected to or like saw my queer experience reflected there. So I'm really excited to get to this one. I, I don't know a whole lot other than that Charlotte recommended it to me. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it and hopefully this turns out to be good. This is another one that I actually requested my library to buy and it just came in. So it also apparently has to do with him um, like going into the forest. I don't know if he's like camping there, living there, staying there, like what's going on. But I also really like like nature, I guess. So I feel like bisexuality, nature, like these are all themes that I want to explore and I'm interested in reading about, so. Okay, the next book I have is Real Life by Brandon Taylor. I've been seeing this everywhere. Pretty much every reviewer, book person that I trust in the community that has read it has really, really liked it or raved about it. And so I'm excited. I already spoke about it a little bit in my mid-year book Freakout, but essentially I believe this is about a black gay man in the Midwest and kind of follows his experiences in college, so. I'm excited to get to this. The next book is My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich by Evie Zaboy. And this is a middle grade, I believe, about a girl who lives in, is it Harlem? Yeah, she moves from Huntsville, Alabama to Harlem to stay with her dad and her grandfather is one of the first black engineers to integrate NASA. And so being a black kid, black person, whoever, who grew up fascinated with space and Star Trek and the Matrix and science fiction, all those kind of things. I'm really excited to read this because I want to see like a nerdy black kid who's obsessed with space. Like I, I would live for that representation. Like not that I like grew up to be an astronaut or something or that I'm going into STEM like, but I, I just feel like this could be excellent representation for middle grade girls who are interested in going into STEM because Again, it's a field that really excludes women. There's not a lot of women that go into it. I feel like girls are discouraged and dissuaded from uh, pursuing an interest in STEM. So yeah, really excited for this as well. And I don't think I've read any E.B. Zaboy yet. I did read Black Enough, which I believe was like, she was the editor of that short story collection. So that's really all I know of her. The next thing I picked up was Octavia E. Butler's Unexpected Stories. And I believe this is two short stories that have been I, I believe this is the first time they're being published, like they haven't ever been published before. And so I have not read any of Butler's short stories yet, not even her collection Blood Child, but obviously I've been doing a lot of reading Butler this year. Like I, I believe I'm one book away from finishing Pattern Master, one or two books, like her Pattern Master series. So yeah, I'm excited to dive into this and uh, get to Kindred and whatever else of hers I haven't read yet, like I will be reading her entire body of work, so. 
The next book I picked up was The Subtweet by Vivek Shreya. You all know I freaking love Vivek Shreya. I rant and rave about her on this channel and I pretty much nothing of hers I've read I've disliked. But The Subtweet was not my favorite. This is like a YA novel about I guess the indie music scene, a lot of female friendships or rather what I would describe as frenemies, you know? Like it's not a lot of great relationships in here, it's more very fraught relationships and it also deals a lot with from the title you can tell but social media interactions and I really just felt like it's well written but I feel like the story wasn't that compelling like I really feel like unless you're an indie musician you're not going to be interested in the details of using Ableton which is like music making software right and, and unless you're a person who's really interested in like social media or the uses of social media like it, it was so bad to the point where they were like imagined social media interactions in here and at that point I was just like this isn't even happening like this is just in the character's brain why do I care like it was a lot of just like details if that makes any sense and I'm, I'm obviously not the target audience for this but I really think there was a lot of great commentary about racism and like social justice like commentary on society but I just really don't feel like a fiction book was like the best way to deliver it. Like I really prefer Vivek Shreya's poetry and I really felt like it was more direct and impactful when it was presented that way rather than as commentary coming out of these characters' mouths. So yeah, this was really disappointing for me. I rated it two stars. I've rated almost every other book I've read by her four stars and above. But yeah, this was really just not doing it for me. I, I don't know what to say. The next book is Good Morning, Destroyer of Men's Souls. And this is by Nina Renata Aron, is my guess. But um, I love this title, first of all. And second of all, the reason I wanted to, wanted to get this, it's subtitled A Memoir of Women, Addiction, and Love. And I believe it documents her experience as being in an abusive relationship with an addict, which is something that I have gone through in my past as well. And so I was really interested in reading about coming out of an abusive relationship specifically with an addict because addiction changes people, right? Like when you get into a relationship with somebody before they're an addict and then they become an addict while you're in the relationship, you know them as the person that they were before, right? Like you see the good in them even when they start stealing from you to support their addiction or doing things that are out of character and acting like a completely different person. You still love them and want them to go back to the person that they were, but they can't because they're in the hold of the addiction. And so it becomes really hard to let them go because it's almost like they're possessed and they're not even the person that you fell in love with. Like they've been taken over by this alien host, right? Like that's what it feels like. And so I was really interested to read about that experience because I feel like it's not talked about and there are not a lot of people in the world that understand why you would stay with someone and all they see is the abusive aspect and they don't see the addiction factor and they don't see why it's it's already hard to leave an abusive relationship but it's even harder when you know that person is not themselves and you still love you know the person that they were and you still see through to who they really are but it's like you gotta let them go because the only way for them to learn is to figure it out themselves they're never gonna do it because you want them to they have to make the choice to quit and get clean and all that stuff for themselves. So I am very, very curious to read this. Very interested. That's really all I can say. Okay, the next thing that I got was Stop Telling Women to Smile. And this is by Tatiana Fazlazadeh. And I'm probably saying that wrong, forgive me. The subtitle is Stories of Street Harassment and How We're Taking Back Our Power. And I have seen this woman's art online, um, like pictures of it, and I believe she does like murals and stuff. And so I was also really interested in this because obviously like most women in the entire world, I am someone who experiences street harassment, you know, even while I'm exercising and have headphones on or um, just walking downtown. It's something that I've had to deal with throughout my life. And so I'm really interested in what we can do to combat it and reading other women's stories and, you know, feeling not as alone in that because it's something that's just considered the norm and okay for men to do in our misogynist patriarchal society. And I, I just think it's unacceptable you know, to comment on strange women's appearance, you know, like what gives you the right to take up their time and their space and their energy and what gives you the right to be able to say whatever you want and commentate 
on random women's bodies that have no relation to you. I believe there's even a website of some sort attached to this. Um, I don't know if it's affiliated with this book or not, but yeah, stop street harassment. Yeah, but anyway, so I'm excited to get the, to this because I feel like it's gonna have a lot of her art and then also just like share the different stories um, and experiences of these women, so. Yeah, that'll be good. The other thing I have is White Negroes, When Cornrows Were in Vogue and Other Thoughts on Cultural Appropriation by Lauren Michelle Jackson. I'm excited to get to this um, because it's like a nonfiction about appropriation, specifically appropriation from uh, black cultures. Black culture has kind of become mainstream and to the point where it started to kind of become confused with like popular culture. A lot of terms in African-American vernacular English have sort of become mainstream and people often mistake them for internet slang when in reality that's A-A-V-E. And so a lot of people appropriate that type of stuff. Like I have had, the number of people that I have had say fam to me, and I'm just looking at them kind of out of the out of the corner of my eye because it's like, you're a white person, you know? Like I almost feel like they should not be using that. Like that should not, those terms should not be coming out of their mouth. Like cis should not be coming out of your mouth. Um, you know, like different things like that. And there are also white people that say it's just a hairstyle why can't I wear dreads? Why can't I wear cornrows? Why can't I, you know, blah, 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 on and on and endless debate. So I'm kind of interested to read about this from the perspective of a black woman who is commenting on the culture. I've been really into black nonfiction recently. Most of the ones that I've read have been on audio, but this one was not available on audio from my library. So that's why I had to get the physical book. So who knows how long it will take me to get through this, but it's happening. And then the last thing I got was this, the Mexican keto cookbook. This is the second keto cookbook that I've gotten out from the library. And okay, I honestly really, really wish that the library would let me keep things out for more than like two weeks, especially when it's a cookbook, just because I feel like that doesn't, <laughs> barely gives me enough time to cook anything out of here. Like we attempt maybe one or two recipes per week because you know, we're busy. And so the rest of the recipes kind of go untried, I guess. And so because we can only keep it out for two weeks and there's always a shitload of holds on cookbooks, you know, we, we have to return it. You can't renew it. And then who knows, it'll probably be months before I ever get the cookbook back. So if you do find a good recipe in your cookbook, I just take a picture of it with my phone so we can like keep remaking it. But so I've been on keto about a month now and I love Mexican food. So when I when I searched for keto cookbooks, I was like, I gotta get this. I haven't even really had the time to flip through this and figure out what, what I wanna make out of it yet, but yeah. Okay, so those are all the books that I got from the library. I would love to hear about what you guys have been reading from the library or drop me a link to your library halls because like I said, I really wanna make this more of a normalized thing. If you're someone who features library books a lot on your channel and I don't know you, I would also love to see your stuff because I'm obsessed with thrifting, thrift hauls, um, used books, any way that is not <laughs> paying for a brand new book pretty much or receiving an ARC. I'm interested in seeing people who make book videos around that. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'm gonna see you in my next video. Peace. Peace.